This is a large garden. Even at 30 miles an hour, it takes a good three or four minutes to get up the front path. It's also a highly individual garden. For a start, its gnomes tend to be larger than most. This is Hornby. He was dumped from a 10-ton truck at four one morning, a gift from a grateful friend. But let's move on. Once upon a time, this was a monastery, a secluded retreat for the little white fathers. A rambling Victorian mansion standing in 50 acres of manicured lawns, sweeping downland and concealing woods. Its latest inhabitant is hardly a monk, though. Oliver Reed, international superstar, legendary hellraiser, a man, according to the gossip columnist, who cheerfully inhabits his own private jungle of battles, birds and booze. <coughs> Ollie Reed is the superstar who stayed. In England, that is. One of the world's top box office stars, a jewel in the crown of the British taxman. His most ardent of fans are at the Treasury. Every performance sends them swooning to the bank. He earns millions per picture, pays a great deal of it back in tax, and still he stays. The reason is largely this, Broom Hall, a house and garden he bought six years ago and fell in love with. came with a field. I went, um, I went to an estate agent shop looking for a field in order that I could jump Dougal, my horse, and build a jump there, a coloured one so he wouldn't get paranoid. And rather than... Uh, I went into the, into the estate agent's office and I said, have you got a field? They said, uh, no, not at the moment. And I went back into the pub again and I said, have, maybe you've got a field with a cottage and I'll buy it if you have that. And they said, no, we haven't. And I said, well, have you got a field with a house? And they said, well, so happens we have. I came down here, got the field and the house. And that was the cottage in the that, field? That was the one. That indeed was the one. 56 bedrooms, 50 acres of grounds, and a lake. At that time, all largely overgrown and derelict. With the help of a tiny permanent staff of only three or four, he's in the process of restoring it to its original condition. His principal helpers, Dobbo, boozing companion, general factotum, confidant, a man who knew nothing about gardening until Ollie met him in a pub and hired him. And Norse, ex-policeman, boozing companion, bodyguard, confidant, a man who knew nothing about gardening until Ollie met him in a pub and hired him. The three of them now share a common passion for the house and its grounds, and the field that Ollie bought for his horse has now given way to a grand design. This is a, a young horse, a two-year-old, which we showed this year in hand. She's... Uh, and the throws have been broken in now, yes? That's right. She's half Clydesdale and half thoroughbred. How many have you got all together? I've got seven, seven broodmares, um, all of which are either Clydesdale thoroughbred crosses or, or Shire. What I'm trying to do at the moment, what we're all trying to do at this stable, is, is to breed in the bone um, so that on the next cross with a thoroughbred, with a, a, a very thick set sprinter, we hope to get the fire and the speed, and here we've got the bone, the size, and the temperament. You think that she's only two. What I'm trying to do is to establish for Great Britain a very big, heavy horse. I'm trying to establish a line breed, Valerie. So you'd eventually hope to see these jumping in English showmen? These, the foals of these, yes, I certainly hope so. Um, I wait until next spring and then put her in foal, put the others in foal as well, and I hope by the end of the year after, then I've got the prodigy that we start breaking in. So it's quite a few years then yet before you're going to see what you actually want to see. But I think that in another six years' time, um, you'll see our name in the frame. If not, um, I spent all my pocket money for nothing. Even a superstar's pocket money tends to get stretched in a place like this. The house costs about £400 a month just to heat in winter. The continuing costs of renovation would give even a building society a headache and you could build a mansion on what it costs just to re-fence the place. And yet, because of filming schedules, 
He's only been, on average, able to spend between six and eight weeks a year here. This is very peaceful, Oliver. When you're actually back home, do you get much time down here? In this Not particular part of the grounds? I don't, I don't fish a lot down here. I, have, I try to uh, watch as much of the, the, of the bird breeding as possible. Because I'm, I'm interested in trying to cross, I don't know whether it's possible or not, um, ordinary domestic geese with, uh, with, with the Canada geese that come down here. They breed a lot here. And I understand that there, are, there are breeders and there are birds that migrate. But we have a lot of, we have mallard and, uh, and of course, coot, and there are some very rare ducks at the other end. I, I don't know their name, of course. It's an ideal place for a bird sanctuary, isn't it? Yeah. Why are you interested? Have you sort of got to know about them? I learn, I learn all the time down here. I don't, I must confess, I don't know enough about wildlife. But I'm learning, and the only way you can learn is I... coming to watch. Oh, yeah, exactly. Watch the birds. Mm. What I find fascinating, Ollie, is this is all so different from the kind of roles that you play on the screen. Great, strong, violent, rumbustuous characters. And here's an Oliver Reed who cares about wildlife and has horses and loves trees and just pottering about his grounds. Are there, in fact, two Oliver Reeds, or is this the real one? I think that the, I think that the cinema is a pretense. And probably the real one is me. The thing about Ollie Reed and his lifestyle is that he's a man out of his time. He freely admits that he'd much prefer to have been born 300 years ago, where his unique qualities would have earned him respectable fame as some sort of pirate adventurer. It is September 1940. He has a preoccupation with the past. One of his more innocent relaxations is to sit in his study with a gramophone and relive some of England's finest hours. I didn't realise, of course, that I was going to be as interested as I subsequently found myself in Victorian architecture. And it wasn't until after I had moved into here and realised quite how costly it was, I thought when I had moved in here, first of all, that beyond this room it would be a coat of whitewash and we'd have to put in a, 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 some broken glass and, and mend a hole in the roof. I'd say, oh, it it's, um, <clears throat> seems to be a bit of rain coming through the ceiling there, John, I said to the gaffer. And John said, well, I'm afraid, Governor, that comes from three floors above and it's gone right the way through the Kazi, come right the way through the budgery guard cage and now it's going through the floor and we've got dry rot all the way around. Do you ever actually regret what you've landed yourself with? I don't think that I could ever regret um, something like this, and I think it would be foolish of anybody to say that they would. Um, I regret that I'm not allowed to spend more time here, and that is either because nobody wants to employ me in this country or that it becomes more and more difficult to be able to um, earn enough money or keep enough of the money that one does earn to afford one the facility to be able to keep up something like this. Mm. You see, most people in your position, a major world star, would have got out of this country long ago and be living in some little tax haven somewhere. Is that, did that cross your mind? Or now you've got this house which you obviously love, is it? I was advised mind? several years ago before um, the system changed so drastically um, that it would be in good order for me to move out, I mean, financially, that I could live anywhere in the world and probably live more comfortably, um, which sounds like a joke when you're here. I refused it because I, I thought at that time that it sounded like panic. Um, and that kind, I've never been bullied into a situation in my life, and I don't think that I'm going to be bullied into too many situations. Um, no, it didn't cross my mind. Yes, it did. Of course it did. I mean, the more difficult it becomes to be able to afford to pay people to look after a place like this, and I, and I uh, do not deserve, but I have great loyalty of the few people that I can afford to pay who look after the grounds and the horses, and indeed have worked very hard. I mean, this is a, a monument not only to Victorian architecture, but a monument to the people who have worked so hard on it, which is not solely me, and I'm not looking for a pat on the back, because I'm either in Durango, or I'm in California, or in Hungary, or whatever, earning my bid. What is the history of the house, Ollie? Oh, well, it's been a house here since uh, 1010, and then it was added on to 1744, and then it's Victorian, and uh, the whole thing is... Um, 
and uh, uh, predominantly... Well, um... What's the history of the house, Oliver? Well, it's, it's really a Victorian house. It was built in the end of the last century. There's a bit here that's 1740, which the Victorians added the Gothic-type chimneys to. The cellars are empty of wine. The I do. Listen, it's not every day I get a chance to be seen on television being kissed by Oliver Reed. <laughs>